<clears throat> so I kind of mentioned before that being in the house of the Lord is important. I, I was saved when I was 12, 13 years old, right? It, it was um, amazing to, you know, come to faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and so I was excited about that. It was a good thing, okay? But at the same token, I didn't realize it, it would require me to go to church a lot. Back in the day, I don't know if you remember, but uh, most stores were closed on Sunday. If you wanted to get milk, you had to go to 7-Eleven or the dairy barn if you lived out on Long Island. That's a place you drove the car to and they would hand you the milk. But the major grocery stores, the shopping centers, and, and all of those things were closed on Sunday. And, um, and so there was nothing to do. So I remember that Sunday was church. And so I was excited that on Sundays we would go to church in the morning. Uh, we would then eat dinner. And then uh, we had Sunday night service. God bless. And that was, those were some amazing times. But then I remember in January we had the week of prayer. So I was already used to the fact that, okay, Sunday morning and Sunday night we're in church, right? Got it. Succumb to that fact. Whether I like it or not, I'm going to church. But then the pastor called for a week of prayer. Now, when I grew up, we, we didn't have prayer and fasting in our church. Although people would fast and pray, they kind of did it on their own. Corporate fast in, in the church I grew up in wasn't necessarily something that was done. But they did do a week of prayer. Maybe some people did pray and fast, but... I remember going to that week of prayer, and I told the youth this story on, on Friday night, that I grew up in a time where we did not have the internet. Um, we did not have DVRs. We didn't have satellite television. Um, we were lucky if we had cable, and you may have had one television that the whole family looked at. And if you really were technologically savvy, you can record television shows you weren't going to see on something called a VHS recorder. But you know you would always not be able to set it up the right way, and you were always running short on videotapes, and you ran the risk of, like, you know, recording over, you know, your brother's birthday party or your, you know, the baby shower or something like that. Come on. How many people with the VHS, you've recorded over something that was valuable, right? And then you can't get it back. So there were no hard drives. There were no computers. And so I remember on Monday nights on NBC, the, French Prince of Be the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was on, and... I don't know if you remember how TV was back then, but when you watched TV, you had to watch the show on the night it aired because if you missed it, there was no rerun. You couldn't go on YouTube. You couldn't go and there was no Hulu. You, you had to wait till the summer where they would air it again, and you didn't know when that, when that episode was going to air again. And so I remember it was going to be a new episode of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and man, I was going to see Uncle Phil throw jazz right out the door again and see Carlton do the Carlton. I was so excited. And my mother comes in. I got home from school, and I heard the pastor talk about, you know, the week of prayer, but I thought my parents didn't hear it, and maybe they'd be too busy. And wouldn't you know what my mother said? get your coat on, we're going to church. And I said, but mom, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is on. I said, I don't care who the Fresh Prince is, get in the car, you know. And we got in the car, and I remember on Monday night, I was disgruntled, upset. I sat there, and I no-sold the whole prayer service. Everybody's praying, you know. It was, it was, it was really a, a beautiful atmosphere, but I was, you know, a little fleshly, and I sat there like this, and I just looked at my watch, and I was like, come on. Come on, and when the prayer was over, of course, my parents had to talk, and you know, then we got home, and there was nothing on TV, and then so we had to go to sleep. And so then Tuesday night came, get in the car, we'll go into church. Again? All right, come on, Sunday Monday, Mom, can't we take a break off on Tuesday? In the car. And I went through that whole prayer service, disgruntled, not participating, sitting at the opposite end of the, of the pew to try and let my parents know of my disdain go home, went back to school. Now, remember I told you, no matter how old or how young your kids are, even if they don't want to be here, even if they're tired and cranky, even if you have to chase them or bring 17 coloring books to keep them occupied, I am a huge proponent of them being in the atmosphere. Because if you could allow children to be in the atmosphere, eventually they'll recognize it and it will click. Because on Wednesday night, when I got dragged to church, 
Half of the service, I was again, not engaged, very upset, but I was called into the ministry. I knew that God called me to pastor, and for some reason, the church was, you know, the lights were low, and one of the lights was shining right on the pastor. And I saw my pastor at the altar, and I saw him kneeling at the altar praying. And not just praying for like five minutes. I mean, he was praying the whole night. And I looked at him, and I said, you know what, Lord, that's, that's what I want to do. And uh, I guess if I can't beat, beat him, I must join him. So I closed one eye. I left one eye open because, you know, it's always awkward to close both eyes in front of your family. And I went to a place where I kind of felt like I was alone and nobody could see me. And I began to pray. And I prayed teenage prayers. I prayed, Lord, I want a girlfriend. I really want a girlfriend. Can you give me a girlfriend? Lord, I want to do good in football. Can you help me do good in football? I prayed some other things, probably some personal things. I probably prayed for forgiveness for being stupid. You know, I was probably dealing with some teenage temptations that I probably had to subdue. And I, you know, I was giving God everything. But when I look back, and I want to rewind back to, Lord, I want a girlfriend. I didn't have a girlfriend at that time, and it was very interesting, because how many people know the Lord knows your heart? Now, I was asking for a girlfriend, but God knew my heart was that I really wanted to be with somebody that I could love, and they could love me. I didn't say, Lord, I wanted to be married, but in my 13-year-old, or however old I was at that point, I can't remember... I was saying girlfriend, but God knew that what I was really asking for was companionship and somebody who would be with me. You know what scripture says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will grant you the desires of your heart. And I felt like the Holy Spirit reminding me of this when I was preaching to the kids. When I was asking God for a girlfriend, I really believe that those became the seeds of me praying for Rachel. That I thought it meant this, but God knew it meant that. And, and I can tell you, I, this is why I'm bringing it to your, to your attention this morning. I still remember the way the room looked. I still remember how angry I was. But I remember on that Wednesday night where God changed my heart and I had an encounter with him because my parents did not let me get out of being in the house of the Lord. They brought me into the house of the Lord. And for my parents, it was important for them to be in the house of the Lord. And I saw the fruit that it yielded in their life. And so when I'm telling you is this, whether it's tonight or it's on Friday nights or it's on Sundays, you've got to fight to be in the house of the Lord and you've got to bring your children. I don't care if they're three years old, five years old, or 17 years old. I'm telling you, I told you the story about Dominic. I'm going to just tell you the miracle of fasting and prayer because Luke right there is the biggest food bully that you will meet on the face of the planet. Every day when he comes home from school, he asks Rachel, what are we eating? What are we eating? What are we going to eat? And then when we tell him what we're going to eat, he says, we're going to eat that? Um, You want to order Chef Wang's? How about Brooklyn Wings? So he's either going to have to go and marry a wing chef or a Chinese restaurant. I don't know what he's going to do. But this kid lives for food. He has to plan his menus out for a whole week. And if he doesn't like what we're cooking, he lets us know. And on top of that, he loves wrestling, and he's got to watch wrestling all the time. And now he's into the New York Knicks, and he watches the Knicks game all the time. He's setting himself up for heartache, Mets and Knicks together. That's a, that's a heart attack waiting to happen. Oh, how many people have walked that road with the Mets and the Knicks, and you know it doesn't lead to much. <laughs> but he's watching the Knicks game. He loves sports. And I can tell you that Luke, since he's been small, And I thank God for the influence of Pastor Lil, because while we were doing the big fast, right, Pastor Lil was teaching our kids how to do the fast as young young children. And I can tell you that Luke does not need to be begged or forced into fasting. He knows. He asked me last night, Dad, what's my last meal? I was like, whatever you want, buddy. So pray for my credit card. (laughs) I'm going to have some guy wheeling in a cart, silver cart of lobster tonight or something like that, I don't know, <laughs> or, or, or Richard from Chef Wang's bringing you a dinner at the house, but I don't know, but the reality is, is that with Luke, I don't even have to tell him, Luke, you're fasting, he fasts, 
he does his Daniel fast throughout all the school. I remember in 2005, you see, because, and I'm, I'm sharing this with you because I think you need to know about fasting, that it's not easy. In 2005, I never fasted up until that point. I was always thinking fasting was for fanatics. I remember in 2004 when I became the pastor, a missionary visited me, and they told me, we've been, we've been fasting for 40 days, just water. And I said, good for you. <laughs> I said this in, in, underneath my breath. Good for you, that will never be me. How many people know, right, famous last words? Then Peter um, and, and Andrew used to um, give me some DVDs and CDs from Jensen Franklin. And I remember I started to get into Jensen Franklin, and then I saw a sermon that he preached on prayer and fasting. And as I was watching it, it was like I forgot Jensen Franklin was even preaching and the Holy Spirit it was almost like, do you ever see the Tom and Jerry where they get the scent of something and then they just float to it? It was like somebody was cooking this delicious dish that I did not want to take my eyes off of that I could not wait to eat. All of a sudden, something I feared and I said, it'll never be part of my life and as long as I'm pastor, we'll have prayer meetings, but we're not going to do the fasting thing. All of a sudden, that aroma started to appeal to me, and I said, Lord, I need this in my life, I need this in my family, and we need this in this church. So in 2005, we got together with the leadership, and we planned our first ever five-day fast. And everybody who wishes we had a five-day fast now, don't say anything, you'll hurt my feelings. And we thought we were really big, and most people did the Daniel fast. I think I did the full fast, and we started the fast on Sunday night, and then we ended the fast on Friday night because we thought if we asked people to go seven days, they wouldn't follow us. And I remember after the fast on the the fifth day, we ended service early, and we all raced to Famous Dave's Barbecue Place, and we ate like kings and queens. We almost sent three people to the emergency room that night because they hadn't eaten all week. It was fabulous. And yet what we found out in that fast was God started to exponentially bless our church. Within two years from that fast, the doctors came and talked to us about buying the medical building. We started to have summer fest. The church started to grow. We went from two services to three services. People were experiencing miracles. And in our family, if you think that your kids are too young to fast, I want to I wanna just tap you on, on the heart right now, and I just want to let you know, this is not because he's the pastor's kid or I'm the pastor. You have to stop minimizing the miracles of God in anyone's life by saying, well, that's just because they're. Do you realize you are minimizing God when you start to quantify why people are getting blessed and not being blessed? We started as a family in 2005, and we said to Dominic at a young age, we said, okay, son, we're going to fast. And he's like, what's that? I said, don't worry, Pastor Lil will tell you. We're going to give up some things so that we can pray for God to move in our lives and move in the church. And he said, okay. And so Pastor Lil had the kids fast, and I think they gave up chocolate and video games and maybe their siblings. I don't know. I, you know he, he didn't talk to Luke much that week. But. And I remember he was young. We were a young family. And he didn't watch any TV that week. He just watched VeggieTales. Uh, and we didn't have Netflix back in the day. We barely, I think we had 56K or DSL service. Come on now. So there wasn't any on-demand television. And so all we had was the VeggieTale tapes and and Grandma and Grandpa Wiser, which was this old video that Dwayne Parrish used to sell when he came to do evangelistic meetings. And I remember every day, Dom would do his fast, and we would pray. And I remember on the Friday night when we ended that fast, right before we went to Famous Dave's, there was a guy who was going to the church at that point. He worked in Manhattan at a place that was like a toy store, and they tested toys. And he said to me when he walked in the building, he's like, is your son here? Because we told Dom, he said, listen, when you fast and pray, God's really going to bless you. And we thought, you know, God's going to bless you spiritually, but we had no idea what God had in store for him. When you fast and pray, God's going to bless you. And here this guy comes in 
with this big power wheels. You know the things, the cars that the kids could drive that you hook up to the battery? When we grew up, we didn't have that. Mom and dad didn't get, give us that. We had a handed down Hot Wheels. Plus, we exceeded the weight limit in size for all the power wheels over the years. They didn't make power wheels for husky children. <laughs> when we would get in our friends' power wheels, we pressed the gas and it'd be like, mm, no, not today. <laughs> And I remember this guy came in with the power wheels for Dominic. And I remember, I remember that like that was something we couldn't afford. We could barely pay for the diapers and the formula for Luke and all this other stuff. I mean, things were tight with us as a family. There was no way I could have went out and afforded that. And here's my son all of a sudden. Dad, does this happen every time we fast? <laughs> I, said, I said, listen, I don't know if it happens every time we fast. But when you fast, God doesn't forget you. And he always hears your prayers. That same kid, I can't remember, I'm getting old now, and I got a lot of kids, you know, so I'm not sure exactly what age that was, 2005, you do the math, he was born in 2002, he was three. That same kid called me on Friday, and him and Willie and a couple other kids were in BJ's, all buying juice because they're doing a full fast with us here at Next City Church, all the way at the University of Valley Forge. I didn't tell Dom, you need to fast. I didn't tell him this is what we do. He's at college. He could use the calling card, I'm at college. He could tell me he's fasting, lie about it. Holy Spirit will get him, but you know what I mean? But, you know, he doesn't have to do this. And I haven't told him he has to. But because it's part of who he is since he's been three, he's doing it. I may not leave my children millions of dollars, although I, I pray I do, and it will only go to you, not your cheapskate husband. <laughs> you can give him something, but, you know, don't let him know what you got. All right, good. No, no that's not good in marriage. We'll, we'll, we'll erase that later. You got to share. You two become one. I understand, but you really, why do you got to break my heart like that? <laughs> I may not be able to leave my, my family the hugest inheritance. Let's just be honest. But I know when I leave... I know they know how to tithe. I know they know how to worship. They serve the Lord, and they pray and fast. And I know when I leave this earth, they're going to be okay because we've set the foundation. And I took the equity of time in this service because, see, there's some of you here. There's some of you here that are young, okay? Now, I saw Dave Ramsey put this up, and I was going to share this on Friday, but I, I couldn't really figure out the thing. He said this. If you take $100 a month and invest it from age 25 to 65, $100 a month, you will wind up with $1,176,000. And underneath it says, you don't have to retire broke. Now, if that's the case with finances, I want to speak to some of you who are younger. If you're under 25, I want you to understand... I was 29 years old when I first fasted, and I said to myself after that first fast, I wish I knew this sooner, but I think of my kids, and I think how they've been doing it since they're three, and I realize when they're going to be parents themselves, the depth and the richness of their relationship with God that they will have is going to be greater than I had at, my, at their age, and so if you're young... Don't say to yourself, I'll do this when I'm older. I'll do this when I'm in my 40s. Right now, I got to work my game. I got to do my hustle. I'm in school. I got a young family. I'm telling you, the younger you start, the more you're going to have later on. Because fasting every year brings about exponential blessings. How many people have seen that already? Amen? Amen. <laughs> And by the way, if you are starting a little late in the game, <laughs> I'm telling you, man, he's exponentially blessed me too spiritually in ways that I can't even imagine to tell you. And so fasting, what it does is it bridges the gap. Is this blessing somebody this morning? I understand, you know, there's a couple of texts I want to share with you, but Jesus understood several things. When he went to heaven... Fasting would be our link to bridge the gap and connect with Jesus immediately and powerfully. Jesus says, then they will fast. He made sure that the Pharisees knew that every believer would fast when the time was right. And when he says, then they will fast, he's saying, the day is you. Fasting 
clears up the distance because how many people know what distance does? It brings misunderstanding. It brings miscommunication. It brings missed opportunity. I I just want you to think, how many times in your life have you been distanced from the word of God and then you start to think things that are not in this word? How many of you have ever been distant from worship and distant from church and distant from abiding in the beauty of Jesus? And then you start to make up your own idea of who God is. You let the influence of the the world try and paint the picture of who God is. Oh, but when you abide in the beauty of Jesus and you abide in his word and you see God for who he is and you have friendship and fellowship with the person of the Holy Spirit who lives in you at salvation, you start to not uh, misunderstand God. You start to know and see him for who he really is. And listen, every one of you should have a reason for praying fasting. Every one of you should have a reason. I hope that that you want good health. And I want to tell you something. Fasting just doesn't have spiritual blessing that comes to you. How many people know healing comes forth rapidly when we pray and fast. How many people know fasting has medically proven benefits for your life? Amen. But I hope more than the things you're believing for, I pray that the number one thing that you want in this fast is closeness to Jesus. Fasting is important and you need to do it to defeat the the spiritual powers and forces of the devil in this dark world. I believe you need to take a target and shoot an arrow at those strongholds. And I believe there's going to be spiritual victory. But scripture tells me when I delight myself in the Lord, he grants me the desires of my heart. Scripture tells me when I stop worrying and I decide to seek first the kingdom, Matthew 6, and his righteousness, then everything else gets taken care of. So how many people believe with me that if we can just go all in and let fellowship with the Holy Spirit and abiding in the beauty of Jesus and growing closer to Jesus be our goal, then everything else will follow. Everything else will follow. Do the one thing. And God will take care of everything. Now, some of you may be saying, well, you know, I'm already close to Jesus. I'm good. I don't need to be any closer. I'm good. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. I'm part of 17 prayer groups. You know, I preach. I teach. I do this. Imagine if I said to my wife after 25 years, you asked me, how's your relationship with Rachel? We're good. We're better than we've ever been, no need for improvement. We're as in love as we're ever going to be. We're good. There's no reason. Could you imagine if I said that about my wife? I would sound like the biggest jerk. In marriage, you can never love your spouse enough. You can never get to know them enough. I'm married to her 25 years, and I can't wait for the next 25. It's going to be the best 25 we've ever had. I'm so grateful for 25 years of marriage because when we met each other and we fell in love when we were first married, we were in love, but man, the depth of the love now is richer than it's ever been. But just because we've had 25 good years, are we going to rest on this and be like, okay, we're good. Let's split the beds like Ricky and Lucy. You know, let's, let's just exist. Let's get the kids out to college and then I'll follow you at the mall with your purse in my hand saying, how come the kids don't call? How come the kids don't call? We'll go, we'll go to breakfast at 5, lunch at 8, dinner at 12, and watch Steve Harvey and Family Feud at 7, and then fall asleep. Yeah, that's our life. No. You've got to believe in marriage that, that you're never through growing close to each other. And when you hit your highs, there's always the next one. And I want to know more about her, and I want to grow closer to her, because the longer you're in love, the richer and the deeper it becomes. And Scripture says that you are the bride of Christ. We're married to Jesus, church. So therefore, we can't have this attitude about him. We're good. I'm reading. I'm praying. I'm in church first Sunday of the month, man. I'm, I'm on the all-star team. I'm good. No, no, I have to do that. You know what? I'm busy. I got a lot of stuff going on. The Lord knows my heart. All right? What does that say about our passion for Jesus? I'm going to tell you something. There's never going to be a good time to pray and fast. Can I share my schedule with you? Good. I know you said yes, please. So tonight, 
we got church. Tomorrow, we got a small group leaders meeting in the night. The whole day, I need to come in, take care of the office, write my resignation letter, put it under the, under the thing, because on Monday, you always write your resignation letter. You never submit it, but you always cry on Monday. You know, deal with the administrative stuff in the offices, and then I lock myself in, and I'm going to work on a sermon, because on Tuesday night, I'm preaching for Bethlehem Church in Valley Stream, Steve Malazzo. They're having revival services, and he asked me to come and be one of the speakers for the week of revival. And I'm going to be speaking to them on, on prayer and fasting and revival. And then on, on, on Tuesday morning, when I get up, I have to go to a seminar for pastors with Dr. Michael Brown at Steve's church. Then I come back home. I pray a little bit, get my head straight. I go preach at 730. I come back on Wednesday. I, I, once again, administration at the church. Then I get ready for Wednesday night, small groups where it's going to be, I'm going to be giving you Bible study every Wednesday night. Then we do our small groups, then I go to bed. Then I come back on Thursday, which is my day off, and we have credential meetings, credential interviews where people from all of our region to be coming to be pastors, and they're going to meet with a credentialing team, and we're going, to, we're going to interview people throughout the whole day at the church office, and so I'll do that. I'll probably get home about 5 o'clock. I may come and hang out with the worship team and just say hi to them. Then Friday, I'll come back into the office once again, start to get ready for the weekend. We have service at night, prepare my heart for that, deal with the administrative duties, probably have some meetings on Saturday, work all day on Sunday's message. On Sunday, eventually preach, come home, finally get a little bit of break, then start to pack because on Monday, I fly out to Syracuse. I'm in Syracuse from Monday to Thursday evening for meetings. Wednesday night, still have to do the video Zoom with you guys. Friday, come back, do church. Saturday, get in the attic all day, get the message ready for Sunday, preach, finally breathe. We're in our third week of fasting. It's never a good time to fast. And you guys, there may be some of you in this place that are even busier than me. Oh, and by the way, I have a wife and three kids. And that's also part of the gig, and we still got to find time for us doesn't make sense for us to fast in this season. And on the last day of the fast, when all you break it, I'm preaching in the Hudson Valley for the end of a 21-day fast with all the churches of the Hudson Valley. They asked me to come and preach about, about prayer and fasting over there at the culmination of their fast. So I can't eat before I preach because Lord knows, the first time you eat after 21 days, you activate the launch sequence. And some of you are saying, Pastor, how on earth can you do this? Knowing that I'm going to do the full fast, here's the deal. Number one, When you fast, the invitation is from the Lord to you. Number two, what you fast is not up to your stomach, your mind, your schedule, or what your will tells you. Because if what I fasted during these 21 days with all of those things, and oh, by the way, I still got to make sure that I'm not so busy that I spend my time ministering and not eating the bread of life for myself. So there has to be that discipline In the midst of that busy schedule, because I'm going to tell you something, sometimes it's easier to fast when you're busy, because the busyness fills up the time, and then you can go through two weeks and not even touch the Bible and touch the prayer closet except for a couple of little taps. So see, if you fast and you don't feed yourself the word and abide in the beauty of Jesus, you're just dieting. But when you accept the fast from the Lord, Jesus is telling me to do the full fast. So what's that going to look like when I got to preach all these times and I'm coming to day 21 and I preach two services here, then I got to drive up to the Hudson Valley on a Sunday and preach a big service over there at night, not eat for 21 days, just have some juice, broth, maybe a little bit of little protein shake every once in a while. How on earth am I going to have the strength to do that? Do you know why? Because when you accept the invitation for the Holy Spirit, it's not on your strength. He gives you the grace to do it. That's why it's so important that what you fast, how you fast, when you fast, and what you fast for needs to be downloaded into you. The Holy Spirit needs to give you that invitation. And so if the Holy Spirit is telling you to do a full fast, do a full fast. If the Holy Spirit is telling you to do a Daniel fast, do a Daniel fast. If the Holy Spirit is telling you the room to pray and where to pray and how long to pray in, you trust because the grace to do what God is inviting you to do has nothing to do with your willpower. 
power. And by the way, don't allow your schedule, your stomach, and your human nature to get in the way of you deciding to fast. Because if you decide to fast, you will crash and burn. But only when the Holy Spirit designs your fast will the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit help you to fulfill that fast. And everybody said amen. Amen. Fasting, what is it? It's emptying yourself out and starving the flesh so that the Holy Spirit can move, renew, empower, clean out, heal, overhaul, direct, connect you to Jesus more powerfully. It is making Jesus the main dish, the bread of life. There's this one restaurant we go to. Luke loves it. He really doesn't. It's called Maggiano's. You ever been there? Maggiano's over in the mall. They're all over the country. And somehow Luke doesn't like it. I remember one time it was Dominic's birthday. The actual day. We drove all the way to Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, to say, Dom, we're going to take you out wherever you want to go. Dom said, Maggiano's. And Luke was like, Dominic, do we really have to go to Maggiano's? I said, Luke, it's his birthday. I know, but isn't there another place he wants to go? Isn't there any Chinese restaurants he'd like to go to? Anyway, Maggiano's, how many people know the first thing that comes out when you're at a good restaurant is bread? How many people, you go to that Olive Garden because they give you the free bread and the salad? Come on. You can raise your hand. I'm not going to come down as you go to the Olive Garden. There's a legitimate Italian who lived in Italy who loves the Olive Garden right here in the second row. So if a legitimate, authentic, lived in Italy Italian until he was 15 years old, can speak Italian... And make some amazing eggplant parmesan. Loves it. It loves the Olive Garden. Then we gotta love the Olive Garden. That was for you, Dad. Now, how many people go to the Olive Garden? The food may be, eh, but you get that free bread and salad. Come on now. <laughs> when that bread comes out hot, come on now. How many people in Maggiano's? The bread comes out so hot, and it's so good, and you dip it in the earl, right? But then. <laughs> But then you take it home, and it becomes a hockey puck. It's never the same. How many people have ever done it? You've been to a restaurant, the bread's good, then you take it home, and all of a sudden it changes like its chemical te- texture because it came into the air of your home. Does anyone else have this problem, or does Maggiano's give you different bread when you take it home? The bread is the, the first thing you get, but it's not the main dish. And sometimes we could look at bread as like, eh. How many people have ever been to a restaurant where the bread was really nasty? even want to touch it. But Jesus said this. He said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. When we fast, it's about making Jesus the main dish. That's why it's so important. Fasting without eating from the word and abiding in the beauty of Jesus is just dieting. But we've got to get to the point where we eat from the bread of life. And what does this say? How many bread have you eaten over your lifetime that not only satisfies you, but it, it even quenches your thirst? What Jesus is saying is, I'm so good that you'll never thirst or hunger again when you eat from me. How many people want what he's saying? How many people? He satisfies you. He satisfies you. You see, only Jesus can satisfy. In Psalm 107, 8 and 9, it says, Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Listen to this now. Let's say it together. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. How many people believe when you empty yourself out in prayer and fasting, God will satisfy you? And fill you with good things. In Isaiah 58, 11, the fasting chapter of the Bible, it says, The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. And you will be like well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. How many people are grateful that the Lord will satisfy you, not only through 21 days of fasting, but how many people believe that satisfaction follows you into the year? And I love how it says that he will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. How many people can just say amen that the world's been turned upside down? Now I got it that I said it. The world's been turned upside down. 
It's crazy. Inflation, politics, and all this other stuff. Can I tell you something? God's satisfaction of your soul, God's provision to your life, God's ministry to your life is not dependent on the circumstances of the world. Inflation could go crazy. The Antichrist could be running around. The world can be going to hell in a handbasket. But scripture tells us he has never seen the righteous forsaken and the children begging for bread. God satisfying you is not based on the circumstances around you. God satisfying you is based on the truth truth of his word, the, the, the characteristics of who he is and who you are to him. He loves you and he could satisfy you anywhere, but you got to be willing to empty yourself out so that God can fill you up. You have to be aware of King's stomach and you got to notice the movements of Jesus in his distress. In Matthew 26, 38 to 41, See, King Stomach will always tell you, you can't do this. It's not the right time. Jesus said this. He said this to his disciples. Check this out. This is when he's praying and he's about to go to the cross. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Go only the further. He fell with his face to the ground and he prayed. Here's, here's, remember I said, look at the movements of Jesus. What did he do when his soul was in distress? He fell to his knees and prayed. He didn't go to the ice cream closet and get the haagen He didn't talk to the disciples about why he felt so upset that he had to go to the cross. He was feeling the weight of, literally the weight of the world, because he was about to take the sins of the world on his shoulders. That's why it's important. If you want to be a disciple, what's a disciple? Everybody say it with me. A Christ follower who learns to do what the master does. What's a disciple? A Christ follower who learns to do what the master does. That's why it's important that we understand the movements of Jesus. And I wonder if there's anyone in this place, now maybe you didn't feel what Jesus was feeling, but, in your, but you're also not the, 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 you're also not God the son, okay? So, so understanding he's Jesus and understanding you're you. Have you ever been so stressed? Have you ever been so distraught? Have you ever been so, so strung out? Have you ever felt such pain? Have you ever felt such loneliness that all you could do was collapse? And the movement of Jesus tells us, when we don't know what to do, pray. And we see Jesus in, in, with more weight on his shoulders than you and I could ever even imagine having. He fell to the ground and he prayed. And he said this, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but your will. Isn't it great that when we look at the words of Jesus, we could see that he knew he needed to go to the cross, but he's still battling the anxiety, and he could be real with God in his prayer. Could you imagine the audacity of this prayer in general? Lord, <laughs> if there's any way that you know this whole plan that you set from the foundations of the earth can be avoided, can we do it? And how many people know that that was important for the process of Jesus going to the cross? Because that's why scripture says, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And how many people know it's not just enough to come to Jesus, but you got to give him everything. And I pray on this fast, you wouldn't pray with sanitized prayers. I pray you pray honest, ugly prayers that you would finally get out the rage. That you, listen, in you right now, you have been minimized, you have been hurt, you have been talked about, you have been cheated on, you suffered injustice. And the worst thing that you can do when you have the scars of life is silence them to the side and only give God your sanitized prayer. If you've been hurt, if you've been passed over, if you've been cheated on, if you've been betrayed, if you suffered injustice, if you've got a lot of things that have happened to you and you're angry about them, what you need to do is you need to truly give God the good, the bad, and the ugly. Release it all because what you hold on to will eventually become a cancer in you. When somebody has cancer and they got to go for an, an operation to get the cancer out, they don't go to the doctor. Doc, listen, um, about this cancer, right? I understand it's bad. 
I understand it's really bad. And if I let it go, it's going to kill me. But you think, you know, because there's 25% of this cancer I don't want anybody to know about. You think you can only remove 75% and leave the 25% in? Would you ever, ever have that conversation with a doctor? If you knew you had cancer and you knew that the operation would save it from spreading and add 50 years to your life, you would, you would make sure after the operation. I know I would. I'd be sitting there, big scar across the back, probably have an X on my chest or something like that, you know, look like Frankenstein. Big scar, I'd be there in the follow-up with the doctor. Listen, doc, I know you said that uh, you take it all out, but is it all out? And because I'm skeptical and I'm Italian, Doc, uh, you got any pictures that shows me it's all out? Because we ain't making final payment on your visit here until it's all out. Doc, is it ever going to come back again? I let you open me up. You better take it all out. None of you would leave an ounce of cancer in your body. You'd let it come all out so you can live. And I believe God's word to you on this fast is if you want to live, this is the fast where everything needs to come out. The hurts from 25 years ago. The things you've allowed to come into your ears, your eyes, your heart, and your soul. The things that have taken root. And we need to let them out so that they never come back in this body again so that you can be free. And here's the beauty of it. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. You let your stuff out to a doctor or a psychiatrist, they may get you halfway and give you medication. But how many people know when you let it all out to the Lord, oh my Lord, when you let it all out to the Lord, he makes everything beautiful in his time. He's not just the healer of your physical body. He's the healer of your heart. He's the re redeemer of your soul. He's going to speak into you. how many people are excited we can pray prayers where we could release it all to God and then say Lord let your will be done my hope is in you oh he who the sun sets free is free indeed and when you start to have friendship and fellowship with the Holy Spirit where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom oh my Lord could you believe the power that's going to come when you walk in that freedom you don't have to limp anymore. You don't have to be hurt anymore. This is the fast where God is going to shoot you forward. And you're not going to have anything holding you back. You're going to have pinpoint accuracy because God is with you. But his disciples, when he returned, he found them sleeping. And he said to them, couldn't you keep watch for me for an hour? And he asked Peter, watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. And he says this, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our flesh is weak. And none of us can be super fasters by going through the next 21 days in the fast. That's why we daily need to plug into Jesus. I went to Dallas one week to see WrestleMania met up with some friends from the Dream Center. My friend Clint rented a Tesla. Uh, and uh, of course, he didn't let me drive it, but he rented it and he paid for it. So how many people know that's good? That's a cheap WrestleMania. He rented a Tesla and he's driving us all around Dallas. But the one thing we had to do with that Tesla, I don't know if anyone has a Tesla. There's some people who have a Tesla here. But my biggest fear with the Tesla is that you can't drive it to like California if you wanted to. You can, but you gotta stop and you gotta charge it up. That that car is only good if there's electricity in it, right? And so I remember every day before we went to the arena, we had to go to a you know, convenience store where we would plug into the charger because that car was only gonna go if it had the correct amount of charge in it. Did you catch what I'm saying? Your phone, most of you, charge this phone next to your bed. Come on, how many people do you charge this phone next to your bed every night? Every night, you plug it in, all right? Put it in low battery mode so it charges quick. Some of you don't. We know who you are. We'll pray for you later. But before you go to bed, this phone is useless. Come on, how many people have ever forgot to charge this, and then it's dead for the rest of the day, and all your relatives are calling the missing persons people to come and look for you, Right? Where were you? My phone was dead. I didn't charge it last night. I'm so sorry. But this phone is a paperweight. 
if it doesn't have the power. That's why it's so important on this fast that you have daily connection with the Lord. Because if you don't, you're not going to have the power to make it through the 21 days. That's why it's so important, and I, I just say this, and I'm going to bring this too close because I know we've got to be back here tonight. And remember, an hour and 15 minutes, one and done, and we're going we're to start this fast together. But Galatians 5.16 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The grace of fasting and the ability to resist the flesh comes from receiving the invitation from Jesus to your specific fast, and then walking in fellowship with your friend. Everybody say, my friend. My friend, the Holy Spirit. Can I ask you something? In all years of being saved, have you ever referred to the person of the Holy Spirit as your friend? Yes. If you have, great. But I never did. I would always say the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I need you. Holy Spirit, use me. Holy Spirit, flow through me. Holy Spirit, show up. And we look at the person of the Holy Spirit as an event. But the Holy Spirit is your friend. He's in you to walk with you. And I pray on this fast that you would stop referring to the Holy Spirit as an event and you would abide in the beauty of Jesus and have a fellowship with the Holy Spirit because it says when you walk by the Spirit, then you have the power to overcome the flesh. Fasting is a biblical truth. Are you ready? We're going to go through it quick. Moses fasted for 40 days and received the Ten Commandments. In Esther chapter 4 through 7, when Haman schemed to get the king to sign an order for the annihilation of the Jews, Esther called the Jews of the city to three days of prayer and fasting. The result, Haman's plan was foiled and he was hung on the gallows and the Jews were saved from annihilation. And I'm just going to say this to you right now. There's a, there's a mark on your head. There's a mark mark on your back. And you better believe the enemy wants to destroy this guy and all of you. The, I pray that I'm one of your reasons for prayer and fasting. How many people will commit to pray and fast for your pastor? Because I don't want to become a casualty in the ministry. I want to finish every day that God has ordained for my life. Amen? And so I hope there's people praying and fasting for me. But I'm telling you that there is a mark out on your marriage, on your children. And so just like the Jews had a threat to totally wiped them off the face of the planet, Esther was the one who had favor to go and speak to the king. And she said this. She said, tell the Jews to pray and fast for three days that while I go in to speak to the king, I'll have favor. And by the way, I'm not just asking you to pray. I'm going to pray and fast with you. And how many people know because they prayed and fasted, there was a sealed document with the king's seal on it that had a direct order to annihilate every Jew off the planet. But only certain demons, listen to me now, only certain demons can be cast out but by prayer and fasting. Now, there may not be an evil king, and there may not be a seal, but the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy you better believe the enemy would love nothing more than to destroy your marriage. You better believe the enemy would love nothing more than to destroy the generations of Christians that have come out of you. And some of you are saying, why is it that I feel so much resistance? Why is it that I feel so much anxiety? I didn't even want to come to church today because pastor was going to talk about fasting. And I knew I'd have to hear it. And I'm really not in the mood for it right now because it's really not the right time. Why do you think you're feeling so much resistance? Because you're about to take ground. You're about to have spiritual victory. You're about to say lust of the flesh and the temptations of sin. You're about to save your marriage. You're about to re redirect your bloodline. Generations are going to be blessed because of what you fast. No wonder why you feel so lethargic. No wonder why it snowed and half the church is watching online. Because the enemy would love nothing more than to destroy this church from fasting. Oh, but when we fast, every plan of the enemy is thwarted. The devil is defeated. Satan is powerless. And God God's people start to walk in the anointing totally free. Fasting brings about public rewards from God. The <coughs> Bible says in the book of Luke, <coughs> Jesus returned to Galilee. This is after Jesus fast. In the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. And he was teaching in the synagogues. 
and everyone praised him. How many people know when you fast, you come, you come out of it in the power of the Spirit, amen? Last few things. God desires the first fruits of our lives and the first fruits of the year. And Nehemiah, before he built the wall, he repented and prayed and fasted, not only for him, but for his nation. And how many people know before you do something, pray and fast. Before you get married, pray and fast. Before you buy a house, pray and fast. Before you embark upon your career, pray and fast. Before you go into that new job, pray and fast. And Nehemiah, before he needed the favor to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, before he even laid a brick and, 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 and the trowel and he built that wall, he prayed and fasted and God gave him supernatural favor from foreign kings to build that wall in, in less than 50 days or for however many days, it was about 50 days plus, and he rebuilt the wall in record time, even with Sanballat and Tobias trying to get him off the wall because by the way when you start building and when you start going you will have people trying to stop you but when you pray and fast God will even give you the strength and the tenacity not to be distracted by your haters not to come off that wall that you'll be building with one hand and defending with another oh but what God started in you he who began a good work in you will carry it through to completion is there anybody that can say amen to that so on this fast, the last thing I'll tell you, and there may have been 15 last things, but who's counting amongst friends? Is that, remember the illustration of the bow and arrow? We're supposed to have a real good bow and arrow come today, but it, it came late. So, but we got three weeks of the fast. We're going to bring back the bow and arrow, amen? I'm going to bring it with me to Bethlehem Church and get tackled by their crazy security over there. They're like SWAT team members. If I don't come back on Wednesday, you know I got done by Bethlehem security. <clears throat> but remember I said, some of you are so frustrated because you feel like you've been held back. And God gave me the illustration in my mind of a bow and arrow. And he says that we're the arrow and that we've been pulled back, but being pulled back is not what you think. You've been pulled back so you can be shot forward. Okay. And Lisi was praying and she sent me this illustration about the draw. And on this fast, I believe this is a specific prayer point for all of us, and I believe a, a, a something that God wants to do. When you have the arrow and the bow together, the archer will pull back the bow, and that's called the draw. The draw is the process that involves the pulling of the bowstring back while holding the bow in a shooting position. It's a critical technique. Now, check this out. This is important. This is full circle, and then we say amen, and we go, and we eat. Now, I already started my fast, so please tell me what you eat later, and I'll smell it all in your clothes. But remember, the draw. Ready? It's critical. This is critical. Why? Because what does it do? Check this out. This is, this is it. It transfers the energy from the bow to the arrow, propelling it forward to the target. And I believe God has drawn us back because he wants to transfer his power into us so that when we go, we go in his power. We go in his grace. We go in his anointing, and we never leave that grace. We never leave that power, and we never leave that anointing. Scripture says in James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10 in the New King James, where it says, draw, it says, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near. Notice draw, right? Draw. Let his power become your power. Let his love infect your life. Let his personality and characteristics infiltrate you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. The transfer of power for his glory, fellowship with our friend, the Holy Spirit, abiding in Jesus, and walking forward in this fast and into 2024 in his power. It's going forward, and it's hitting the target with him.